we'd see that happen even in the midst of all the horror we saw god showed up um not always the way we wanted to do but she survived and then those things would happen and that would just kind of keep you going Welcome back to another episode of On the Ground with Samaritan's Purse, where we take you to the front lines and behind the scenes of our work around the world. I'm your host, Christy Graham, and this month marks the 10-year anniversary of the Ebola response in Liberia. Ten years ago, it was on the headlines of every news station, a deadly disease called Ebola was spreading rapidly, and almost no one survived it. Today, I want you to hear from the hearts of many of our staff who were on the ground from the beginning, fighting the deadly disease. They witnessed pain and suffering, and they themselves experienced hardship daily. Even though circumstances were hard, they talk about how God got them through it and how He remained faithful in the midst of the darkest moments. And they learned more about reliance on the Lord than ever before. When Ebola hit Liberia, our staff didn't know what they were getting into, and they had never fought a disease like this before. Samaritan's Purse was already in the country. They had a country office in the city of Monrovia, and they had also began work in FOIA, which is a remote place where no organization had been before. And as the number of cases grew for Ebola, Samaritan's Purse began responding both in FOIA and Monrovia. A mission hospital called Elwa in Monrovia is where Dr. Kent Brantley and his family had moved just months before the outbreak. They were going to serve for two years in the Samaritan's Purse World Medical Mission post-residency program. And Dr. Kent Brantley began leading in Monrovia at the Elwa Ebola Treatment Center. And God had orchestrated all of it. He strategically put us in places where Samaritan's Purse was able to respond to Ebola years later. And now, after a decade, we can look back and thank God for what He did through this response. I sat down with several of our team members who were there during the response. First, I want you to hear from Karen Daniels, a nurse who remembers what it was like leading the fire to fight Ebola and treat patients. I remember thinking the heaviness of it was like, oh my goodness, like I could die. But there was this other part of me that, from a medical perspective, was like fascinated. Bev said, we're going to send you up to the bush right away because I'd spent so many years in the field and that's really where my heart is. And so I said, sure, that's fine. So the next morning they flew me up and uh, and I got taught how to don and doff my PPE. You know, that wasn't a, really a thing in my career, my nursing career. I'd never worked an infectious disease uh, hmm. outbreak and we got thrown in. And at that point, that was kind of the epicenter of of um, the outbreak. Mm-hmm. It was trickling down into Monrovia, but in FOIA, it was, they were coming across the border from Sierra Leone and Guinea. And uh, it was the, the biggest amounts that they had had in the country at that time. Um, and so we really, I was really on the early stages of what was to come. Mm-hmm. And we didn't know, which is mm-hmm. a good thing, mm-hmm. I, I think, because we probably would not have been able to endure Karen and I talked a lot about how sometimes it's good to not know exactly what's coming. We, we couldn't prepare ourselves for it. We might not face it. And I think sometimes it's good when we don't know what we're getting into, but day by day, we allow God to direct and guide us. And again, sometimes if we knew too much, we'd be afraid to step forward in faith. But when He gives us little glimpses and the strength and energy each day, I think it's easier to fight these big battles. I sat down at a round table with Kendall Caulfield, who was the country director in Liberia at the time, and his wife, Bev, and Joni Biker. And in their time in Liberia, they formed a lifelong bond. And I love hearing them recount this pivotal time in their lives. Early on, Bev was sent to FOIA to train the Samaritan's Purse wash staff, who specialize in water, sanitation, and hygiene. Here's Bev talking about what it was like in the beginning. Back then, we didn't know what it was, and getting into something like that was completely foreign. Um, and so going through all the training, you know, doing all the, this is how you clean up all the, you know, the waste buckets safely. This is the spring. This is the chlorine solutions. And I went through everything. And the only thing that was left on my list was to remove a dead body safely. Mm. And so I was like, oh, man. Um, and we had a lot of patients by then, about 20, 30 um, in FOIA, and every day we were getting more. And so uh, one morning, about five in the morning, my phone rang and two women died in the unit overnight. We're, we're going to go in and, and get them. So we went in um, and uh, the one 
mom, she had a little boy named John who was just standing outside in the rain. I'll never forget that. Mm. And she knew that she was dying. So she moved to the other room where she knew the other woman was dying. They put all the kids who were still okay in the other room. So mm. it's like they knew and they protected them. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was my first like full on, here's a dead body from Ebola. Um, and then having to kind of just take that for a moment and put it aside and then go through my to-do list to make sure that we were keeping everyone safe, including this little boy, John, who ended up living. Hmm. His uncle came and got him. Um, but yeah, Victoria Kumba was the first patient. Um, I could still see her gravesite hmm. at the SP uh, graveyard. Um, so those are things that were kind of going on. Um, and then we started getting more and more patients in FOIA. We had a lot of kids, and the kids were the hardest because there was no one to help them. And um, and Bev said, like, we're walking, like, through hell. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the angels are with us. And it was just, it was like that. And God sustained us. I look back and I think, wow, if you told me I was going to do some of those things and stain my PP as long as I did and... Like, God sustained us. And one woman, I'll never forget, she was really, really sick. And uh, she couldn't keep anything down. And she kept losing her IV. And I just said to her, and she would call for help all the time. We were so short-staffed. And, and I came through one day, and I said, you know, you've got to drink. You've got to, even if you're just, just take sips of water and do this. Mm. And she said, I can't, I can't. And I said, okay, well, can you sing? And she said, I can sing. And I said, okay, you sing. When you get scared, you sing. When you're afraid, you sing. When you feel like you're going to be sick, you just sing. Because the Liberians can sing beautifully. Hmm. And I thought she'd be dead the next morning. You know, I'd gotten off that night. And when I left her and I came in and she totally turned the corner. And I said, what What happened? She said, I sang. I sang. And Jesus, Jesus came and he healed me. And... Um, and, you know, we'd see that happen even in the midst of all the horror we saw. God showed up. Um, not always the way we wanted him to, but she survived. And, and those things would happen, and that would just kind of keep you going. The Lord continued to provide, even in the midst of some of the darkest and hardest circumstances. He was present, even though they walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Things were at their bleakest when two of their beloved members of the team, Dr. Kent Brantley and Nancy Reitbold, contracted Ebola. I cannot imagine what it was like to receive this devastating news. Karen talked about this. Kendall called me on a Tuesday and said, um, Karen, I need to tell you something. Kent is sick. And I was like, what? And I'm like, I mean, he seemed okay when I saw him. And he's like, yeah, we think it's malaria. So then I get a call on Thursday and they're like, no, no, it's, he had a false negative. Oh, but he's still sick and they still think he has malaria. And in my heart, I was like, he doesn't have malaria. He has Ebola. I know it. So we kept working and by this point we were just getting hammered. I mean, they were just coming in from every location. In one place they brought in 13 women from one village. I mean, it was just horrific. And... Um, Saturday night, Kendall called me and said, Ken's positive. So I called the team and I just, yeah, I just said, guys, I have really bad news. Kent is sick and he's got Ebola and Nancy's sick too. And, and it was just stunned silence. Like, you know, I mean, we all knew what it could be. And James just got down on his knees and like tears just streamed down his face, put his hands and he's like, just pled for their lives. And um, so it was just very, very difficult. I said, Kent has tested positive for Ebola. And Nancy has tested positive for Ebola. And the room went silent. And then people started to react. Mm -hmm. And so you could hear somebody crying over here. You could hear somebody over here was just kind of like, no, it can't be true. No, no, it's not true. No. Now the teams had found out the most devastating news. And this hit home because it was personal. Two of their own had contracted this deadly disease. And with all the stress and long hours in the unit, Karen's condition began to decline. And on top of this, her friend Taya, along with other staff members, were attacked. 
I woke up that next morning and I, I was like, I do not feel good. And I was like, okay, I don't have a fever. I'm fine. I think it's just stress. Well, that morning our outreach team had gone out and Taya had gone out with the nationals. And about an hour and a half after she got out, she called me on the cell phone and she's like, Karen. And I'm like, yeah, where are you? She's like, uh, I'm okay, but we got attacked at the primary health care center and we managed to get out, but I'm hiding in the bush with my driver and some of the guys. I mean, they had gone in their, their scrub suits and these giant white rubber boots. I mean, talk about standing out in the bush, mm. trying to hide in the jungle. You've got these giant white rubber boots on. And I was like, Taya, like, what do I do? She knew that community. And I said, she's like, I said, I can call Kendall. But she said, two of the guys ran to the bush and are hiding. We don't know where there is. And they, and they said they were going to burn the ambulance and the community had just freaked out. And this is a community she knew. And some of the guys are hurt. And so I called Kendall. I mean, this is like his daughter. I mean, like that's how close Bev and Kendall are to Taya. They've been with her for seven years. And I was like, you need to just tell me who do I call? Who's this carry point? And I called the area coordinator, James, and he goes, we're going to go get the police. And so um, they send out the SWAT team. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what's going to happen, but oh God, help us. And when you are working under that pressure, knowing that decisions are going to affect life and death, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. um, you just start to get really tired <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and just spiritually, emotionally. I, I love John Freiler for many reasons, but one in particular, he would always just come up with a scripture. Just in the middle of that, he would just say, I'm just going to read this to you. And then we'd read it and go, okay, thanks, John. So how are we going to get Tay out alive? You know, that's <laughs> literally how it was going. And so it was, I mean, from a leadership standpoint, we we started to feel like it was every two hours we were getting kicked in the stomach. You just get to a point mm -hmm. where you can't even, you, you just, you can't handle the fear anymore, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was watching my wife, you know, getting to PPE, and I'm like, is this, <laughs> what are we doing? And I remember telling Bev not to go into the unit anymore. And she was like, why? I said, because, like, you're going to get Ebola. Like, we just don't know how. And when you're tired and now fear is taking over, you start <clears throat> to make mistakes. And all of a sudden, I just thought, Bev's going to get Ebola, you know. I didn't believe what people were telling me at that point. Um, I thought it had gone airborne. Karen Daniels kept me grounded. I will forever be indebted to Karen Daniels. Because mm. she would just look at me and say, Kendall, tell yourself the science. Just remember mm. the science. And um, You have to be spoken truth. Yeah. And, the uh, word and the facts. John Fryler kept on quoting Psalm 91. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a psalm that I uh, will always remember. Where just highlights, you know, his presence, his protection, his provision for us. It's, it's an amazing psalm. Like Kendall said, Every day felt like a battle. They were getting kicked and hit, and they were exhausted. But the team continued to point to one another to Scripture. John Freiler, who has been on the podcast many times, he serves as our member care team chaplain. And in the moment of fear and hardship, he helped them focus on God's faithfulness. We aren't meant to do this alone, and we need to remind each other of God's word and pick one another up when we don't have strength to take another step. The Lord protected Taya and her team. Karen had to quarantine while she awaited her test results. And and so Taya got rescued miraculously. She had a lot of respect in the community, and that's what was shocking because here was someone who had was known in that community, and they went after her. Mm -hmm. But that just showed you how much fear there mm -hmm. was. There was an absolute fear that we were bringing it. There was um, a fear that when they were spraying and decontaminating um, the primary healthcare units, that the, the chlorine solution in the sprayers was had a bowl in it, and we were infecting them. There was all kinds of fear that was rampant, and. The SWAT team rescued our team. Two guys, the two guys that had been missing came running in that night, had basically come through the villages and, and survived. And so no one was killed. But um, it was an incredibly stressful time. And then I got quarantined. And then they, after that incident, MSF evacuated because it was a threat to the team. 
And um, that was their protocol. And M NSP decided to evacuate half of our team. And I could hear the ambulances coming one after another. And the staff had called and was like, where's Karen? Why isn't she here? And they just said, oh, she's tied up with paperwork. They didn't want to tell them. When Karen's first test came back negative and half of her team was gone, uh, she knew her team was overwhelmed as they tried to treat their patients. And Karen made a choice. I don't have Ebola. I'm going back in. I mean, it goes to show you what happens in a, in a stress response and when you're emotionally involved. And we were all struggling. I also couldn't live with the thought of our team just struggling by themselves with no help. And hearing those ambulances just broke my heart. And so I went back in for two more days and worked in the unit and helped them. And then I had to tell them that we were all leaving, which was devastating because it was just... I mean, it was unmanageable, and I've done some really, really hard things in my humanitarian career, but having to leave them um, probably was one of the hardest things. And um, and yet God sustained them, and they understood. And Taya, who I had worked to help get her, you know, back when she was um, unsafe, they had wanted to evacuate her, and I was like, okay. <laughs> I'm okay. And then I flew down to Monrovia that night, and that was the night Kent crashed. And um, I was I was still sick, um, but I didn't have a bowl. I knew that. And so I couldn't, it was too weak to get in the PPE, but I could actually um, help be a hygienist. And so I went over to the house. And I'll forget, we had a big team meeting, and they were evacuating most of the, the team out. I was talking to Lance on the road afterwards, and Lance says, I got to go. I just got a call from Kent's house. And that was the call that Linda Mavula made, said he's crashing, like I think he's going to die right now. And that's when they made um, the decision to give him the Z-Map. I talked to Dr. Lance Plyler about what it was like to make this decision. Uh, and we're going to bring you more on this in next week's episode. But here's Karen sharing her perspective of that night when Dr. Kent Brantley crashed. I walked over to Bev's and I just remember thinking, oh God. And I was too, I mean, I was just at the end of it, you know, my nervous system, I think, was just in shock. I mean, I was just an autopilot, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but I got to the house and Kendall had been called over to, to Kent's and, and we were standing there and I said, Bev, like, Kent's not doing well. And the door opened. We just sat there all like, oh no, whoever's going to walk through this door, whatever they're going to tell us next, it could be like either he's alive or dead. And um, the door opened and Kendall walked in and said, he's still alive. And we just all, but like Beth, like just burst out crying. And then we just prayed. And Isaac Caulfield, who had probably been about 10 years old, 11 years old at that time, um, he came out of his room. We were supposed to have gone to bed and he came out and he's like, mom, like I gotta know. And then he just prayed this beautiful prayer for Kent, mm. like only a little kid could pray. And that really then got us. And then um, I remember thinking, God, why? Why did we get this close? Mm. And he was supposed to leave that night and there had been problems with the plane and he got delayed. And I think, why, God, why did you bring this close only for us to lose him? Like, what is the purpose in this? Mm. And um, he lived through the night. Then we got word the plane was coming and we had to get him ready. And I just remember us getting Kent ready. And he, and I talked to him through the window and he said, Karen, all I've got are scrubs. And uh, I said, yeah, that's fine. Just put your scrubs on because he had to wear a PPE onto the plane. It would be really uncomfortable. I said, that's fine. He goes, well, my name's on them. And I said, uh, Kent, this time the whole world knows who you are. So it doesn't matter if your name's on your scrubs or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, we got him ready and he was so weak, but he was alive and there was just this miracle. And then they gave Nancy treatment and she did better that night too. And there was sort of a sense of relief then at that point. But I just saw amazing people do amazing things in the moment and, and God sustained them and empowered them. And and I look back now and I remember that question I'd asked God, like, why, why didn't you let him? And I knew like he would have died probably if he had made that flight that night, you know, if they tried to take him mm. and he hadn't gotten the Z map. And so God knew in his timing and his sovereignty that there needed to be that day so he could get the Z-map and get home. And, and what I thought in my mind was just this catastrophe. God worked mm. for the good. 
then we got evacuated and Tay and I flew through Newark. And so we landed in Newark and all that was on CNN is Kent getting out of the back of the ambulance in um, at Emory. And I'm like, wow, like it was like surreal. And then I think really when, when I fully processed it, the day he was released, I watched it on video and I just bawled like a baby and all that emotion, you know, hit me too. And it was like, he lived, he really lived. And um, yeah, and it was tremendous. And so I got to see him a couple of weeks later then um, when we came and it was really powerful. And so again, you know, God carried us, but then he also, you know, comforts us with those mm. things to say, hey, you know, I was with you and I didn't forget you. And so it was powerful. Yeah. I love Romans 8, 28 that says, we know for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who were called according to his purpose. And this is such a beautiful testimony of how God truly does work everything for good, even setbacks, even what looks like in human eyes, bad detours or deviations. Looking back, Karen can see God's faithfulness, and she still sees the same faithfulness today, 10 years later. I didn't necessarily always have profound spiritual experiences every day. There was a lot of wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, but when I look back now, I can say, you know, and probably one of my life verses is in Psalm 27. In that last verse says, I, I would have despaired unless I believed I'd see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And um, I had gotten to see that. I left Liberia brokenhearted and, um, and really in not great shape and not thinking I'd ever want to go back there. Hmm. And in 2015, I was able to bring our cleft lip and palate surgical team there and we did surgery and it was really profound. And um, Beth, Beth took me up to a foyer where there was a beautiful cemetery that SSP had helped make and Taya was part of that and, and took me there to see it. And I went back to the the treatment center that was now just a cement pad in the ground and and uh, and just lots of memories. It was, it was therapeutic uh, to be able to do that. It was really hard, but it was very therapeutic. And went to the cemetery and saw gravestones and names of patients that I'd taken care of and helped. And, and, and it was really good, a part of my healing. And then uh, part of the, the coolest thing I think that happened, though, was in 2017, we started our cataract program. And the very first cohort of cataract patients we ever took care of was Ebola survivors. Mm. And I just thought, how, how like God to take something that had left me so brokenhearted and such an impact on my career and to bring me forth to a circle. Um, but to see that I had gone from something that had such devastation to be able to continue to help survivors. They had uh, really bad cataracts, a lot of them, and we were able to help mm. uh, those patients. And so it was just profoundly um, moving that he would entrust me with that, that I was honored to be able to see that come full circle. To close, I asked Karen how this response changed her. I always knew that God's faithfulness, but it was shown to me in such a bigger and, you know, more powerful way that He carried us through that. And and in, in turn, He used it for preparing me for other things that were to come and, and just knowing that. Um, and then I think just trusting uh, even a, deep, a deeper sense of God's sustaining, no matter what comes, but would I still bless you even if the outcome had been different? And so I'd like to think I'd be changed for the better. Mm -hmm. um, I have been asked before, would I do it again? I think, yeah, I'd do it again. I'm so grateful to get a chance to hear these stories of what God did. Um, the morning that, that Karen shared with me, I had read First Chronicles 16, which is David's song of thanksgiving. And I want to read a section for you now. It says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His wonders among all the peoples. And later it says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endures forever. Save us, O oh God, of our salvation. Gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles to give thanks to Your holy name in triumph and Your praise. Blessed be the Lord of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And that is what we wanted to do today. 
As we look back at the 10-year anniversary since our team was responding in Liberia, uh, we wanted to look back and remember and praise God that He is the Lord of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And as you heard, it was traumatic. It was hard. It brought people to the lowest point in their life. Uh, But we look back with praise and thanksgiving to God's salvation. And like I said, next week, you're going to hear from two other staff members who were heavily involved in this response, and they talk about how God worked in and through them. So you won't want to miss that episode as well. Thank you so much for listening, and God bless you.